Coming up on Hard Talk, does it matter if today's capitalism is generating rising inequality? My next guest is influential American economist Deirdre McCloskey. She says it doesn't. Who cares if the super rich get ever richer? Welcome to Hard Talk. I'm Stephen Sacker. Is rising inequality the sickness that could yet kill capitalism? Well, it's a debate currently raging in politics as well as economics. President Obama says income inequality is the defining challenge of our time. My guest today thinks that is to misunderstand 300 years of global growth and enrichment. Influential American economist Deirdre McCluskey focuses on the enduring power of innovation rather than wealth distribution. So, is it okay for the rich to enjoy a party to which no one else is invited? Deirdre McCloskey, welcome to Hard Talk. Thank you. Let's start with the sort of mammoth undertaking you're involved in to sort of chart the massive rise in material prosperity in the industrialised West over 300 years or so. What do you believe is, is the base cause of that massive rise in prosperity? Innovation, smart ideas, and then behind that, the freedom and personal uh, respect that became a, 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 be, be, became a movement in, in England and Scotland and what became the United States in the 18th century. I suppose the immediate question from that is why the sudden burst of innovative economic activity? Why the new sort of generation of ideas people coming around in the 18th century, 19th centuries? That's volume three, which you've <laughs> got to, you've, you've got to make your early um, orders for. It's, it's almost finished. And I argue that more or less by accident in Europe in the 16th, 17th, 18th century, there was prepared this new equality this new equality of freedom and respect for people, and so they had a go. So the word equality has already appeared in yes. your thesis. What we see today is, and I just referred to it, this raging debate about the corrosive impact of inequality. The idea that, that the inequality that is rising in income and wealth accumulation in the industrialized West is actually uh, threatening to undermine capitalism itself. Uh, because you've talked about equality already, should I, I then take it that you worry about that? Yes, but I am concerned about the condition of the working class. I'm not concerned about how many yachts uh, some heiress has, although I, I must say I find it very annoying that I haven't got a hundred foot yacht and the, and the crew. But it, it's not the expenditures on the high end that cause poverty on the low end. And as long as that's not the case, let them have what you call their, their, their party. It's, it's foolish, but I, I, it's not the real problem. The real problem is poverty. And the solution to that is not going after the rich. Well, we'll, we'll get to solutions in a second, but I just want to make sure I've understood your economic uh, philosophy correctly. If one pictures an economic pie and slices it up, Absolutely. the argument right now is whether more and more of the pie, even though it's growing, yeah. is going to the rich, so that in absolute terms, the poor and even the middle class as well are actually getting a smaller piece of pie. I don't think that's actually true. It's a, it's 
asserted all over the place, but I, I don't think it's true. But it, you know, this is where data comes into it. Yes. Thomas Piketty, the French yes. economic historian, and many others too, yeah. can cite you figures over the last 30 years which show while there has been significant GDP growth yeah. in absolute terms yeah. in Western economies, yeah. the middle class and still more the poorer have not benefited. If, Indeed, they are no better off today than they were 30 years ago. No, that, that, that's false. And in fact, even his own figures don't show that. If you, it, it's, it, he's done a fine uh, 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 book, he's an honest man, but he's predisposed to see this absence of growth in real terms, that is, in terms that allow for the improvement of the quality of goods, Ordinary people, ordinary, very poor people in the middle class have got better off. Let me quote to you Barack Obama himself, who in the last year has said that in income inequality represents the greatest challenge of our time. He said, looking at America today uh, and seeing how the poor find it so very difficult to lift their children out of poverty, Americans have to accept that they can and must do better. It's not the material condition of the poor that is the main problem in a modern economy. Because in a modern rich economy like the United States or, or, or the Britain, ordinary goods and services are, in historical terms, cheap and, and available. Of, of, of the problem is education, attitudes that that need to be uh, changed. For instance, in this country, I know that, that ordinary working class people don't feel welcome at university, and that has to be changed. So I'm concerned about the poor. I'm not concerned about the rich. Well, I, I want to focus much of this interview on, on the poor and how Good. the state and interventions can best help the poor. But before we do that, I just want to stick with the rich one more time because it's been such a topical issue, thanks to Mr. P Piketty and others. Here's one more piece of data that uh, I want to put to you. It's from Paul Krugman, who has coined this phrase about a new gilded age, which he thinks is extremely corrosive to uh, economic well-being mm -hmm. today. He says the share of national wealth enjoyed by the top 1% mm -hmm. in America mm -hmm. halved after 1900, mm -hmm. but has gone all the way back up in recent times to where it was in 1900. You've got this U-shaped curve, and he oh. says that is one of America's biggest problems. No, I, I'm afraid, you know, I agree with uh, uh, Paul about 50% of the time. It's the other 50% that's the problem. One, one very serious problem is that those calculations don't account for human capital, which is an immensely important part of a modern economy. And all these calculations are concerned with physical and financial um, um, capital. Most people in a modern economy earn their income from their brains, not from their backs. So it's very wrong to say that, um, that capital has become more concentrated since 1900, say. It's gotten much less concentrated. And, and fu f the fundamental standard of comfort, e equality in the standard of comfort, has improved since 1800 or 1900, not gotten worse. One of the reasons, I think, why there is quite a lot of contention and dispute about the, the data and the meaning of the data is because it is becoming more and more apparent that a lot of the wealth owned by the wealthiest in Western societies mm -hmm. is actually off the radar, yeah. is, is part of a globalized, offshoring, financial, uh, you know, sophisticated economy, which means it doesn't necessarily get taken into account for tax purposes uh, yeah. you know, in, in the nation yeah. state, all that sort of thing. 
And the argument of Krugman and Stiglitz and Piketty and others yes. is that oh, this well. has to be addressed, that one of the fundamental problems is the rich have dominated the political system to a point where the tax system, the political game itself, is dominated by the interests of the most wealthy. I don't think that's, uh, I don't think that's true. But look at U.S. politics and the way it works today. It is money politics. Well, in the last, in the last presidential election, there was an attempt to buy the election by the very rich, and it failed. They, they did not succeed. They were certain that they were going to be able to throw Obama out of office. But surely the message of American politics is that the, the big money, whether it be individual or corporate money, backs both sides. I mean, yes, neither Democrats nor Republicans represent anything but the interests of, well, of big money. Yeah, well, the, but it has always been so. It's the it's the golden rule. Those who have the gold rule. And we must, in, in journalism and academic life, we must lean against that. So you would argue that, that capitalism today is as vigorous, as dynamic, as, as sort of destructive, creative and Absolutely. destructive, as it's ever been? Absolutely. And it's, it's crucial to include the rest of the world. If we focus only on old Europe, <laughs> and the United St uh, um, States, as these calculations do, we'll miss that in China and India, economic growth is going at 7 to 10 percent per year in real terms. But I would say that is another argument against your, if I can put it this way, uh, economically liberal University of Chicago economic philosophy. Because you can't tell me that the success of Chinese capitalism is based on a, a, a pure adherence to market philosophy. Purity is not attainable. Nor, pure capitalism, pure socialism. So we... Sh we I mean, China is state-managed capitalism, I know, and it works. But we must not be comparing perfect capitalism and perfect socialism. We must be comparing actual outcomes. And what has happened in both China and India is massive doses of the market. Now, to be sure, in both countries, the state is still powerful. Managed by uh, the state, managed, regulated by the state, and with managed, massive interventions from the state. Yes, the interventions and, and uh, the crony uh, capitalism and so forth. But, in f but the outcome is that with the introduction of more m uh, market uh, freedom, both of these countries have astoundingly grown. And that's available to countries I know and love very well, such as South Africa and, and Brazil. And when they see it too, the world will become as rich as the United States. But let's Britain. get, but, but I, you were saying something at the beginning I found very interesting about the degree to which the focus needs to be not on the distribution of wealth and inequality, but right. just on the baseline exactly. prosperity or otherwise of the poorest. Right. It's, well, it, if I may yeah. just continue the thought, sure. the argument from Piketty and others is that what is happening to the poor and the rise in inequality is, is directly and relevantly corrosive of economic efficiency, because we are not maximizing in Western economies the education the social and economic care of our poorest, and therefore the potential they represent is being lost. I agree. I think it's uh, scandalous how bad the schools are in the large urban areas in the United States and, and, and Britain, and for that matter, France. But the solution is not more socialism. Surely the solution is to, uh, they would say, uh, use redistributive tax to spend more on educating the poor, on giving them fair opportunity. I'm very willing to be taxed to pay for superior, um, superior e education. I'm all for it. I'm not prepared to be taxed for a state-provided education. That's the distinction. In Sweden, in the in 1990s, they introduced uh, private academies, and now a substantial number of ch children go through them, and it's been very, su su very successful. 
I'm willing to pay through the market to make schools work. They do work, in fact, in large parts of, uh, of, of, of Britain and the United States. I think it's, it's wrong to say that schools and uh, the provision for the poor are worse than they once were. They're not. They're, they're, they've improved. But if you point to Sweden, yeah. I would then point you to, for example, uh, a book that came out four or five years ago called The Spirit Level, mm -hmm. which looked precisely at the difference between uh, the economies of Scandinavia and yes. parts of Western Europe and the United States, yes. and concluded that more unequal societies are unhealthier societies in a whole array of different measurements, from the number of people in prison, the number of people suffering stress and anxiety disorders, the number of people who are failing in their education. I don't think that has anything to do with inequality. It, in my own country, it has to do with these uh, awful laws against uh, recreational uh, drugs that we have. It has to do with an attitude that um, the, the, that you find uh, on the conservative side in all countries, um, jail them, that'll solve things. And it's, it's not a result of capitalism, it's a result of the power of the state used inappropriately. The monopoly of violence. But the, with respect, the, the power of the straight state is much higher in a Finland or a Sweden or yes. a Norway than it yes. is in the United States. It's but, but Wilkinson and Pickett, the academics who wrote the spirit level, concluded right. that, that on so many different socioeconomic measures, they, they were better, healthier places I'm to not, live. I'm not against social democracy in, in places like Scandinavia. I've, I'm, I'm quite... F uh, familiar with Sweden. I've lived for a long time and further south in Holland and they work quite well. The problem is that most states are not competent to do social democracy well. Italy. No Italian <laughs> would suggest that it would be a good idea to give the Italian state more money or power. And although some states in the United States are capable, others, like my own, Illinois, are not. So I think that it depends where you are. It's not a universal feature of, of, a, of a social d democracy on the one hand or a free market on the other. It depends on the, on the culture. Well, I, it's interesting you've, you've nuanced it in that way, because I do, I, if I may, I want to turn this conversation to be a little more personal. I want to stay with economics and history, but I reflect on your own life journey as well, because... Uh, <laughs> as my mother says, don't do anything more interesting. <laughs> <laughs> well, there are, I think a few people I've had in the studio with a more interesting backstory and personal <laughs> story than yourself. I mean, you, you have been uh, a highly respected economist and historian for a long time, but yes. for a, a lot of your career, you were Donald McCluskey, the, the male economist, I and was. now you're Deirdre McCluskey, the female I am. economist. And, and you have said interesting things, and I want to just know what you meant by them. You said... As a young man, I learned to be a standard issue male academic in the mm. way that I made my arguments. Now, I am much more female in my approach to economics. Uh, I wonder well, if you can explain that for me. Well, I, I s I'm more concerned about the poor, for example. I'm more concerned about the, the condition of the world's um, children, and I think they're great future depends on the spread of markets, not on the further strengthening of c corrupt g governments. I'm, and I'm more clear, I got a lot clearer about love, the L word that makes so many men uncomfortable. Well, I must say, I don't read many economic textbooks where the word love appears many you times. You haven't what, read what, my what, books. You've got to read my books. What, what, why should love be factored into economics? And, and also, right. particularly for somebody like you, I go back to this University of Chicago background yeah, yeah. and the idea that in the end it's the primacy of markets that matters. I mean, markets don't factor in love. Yes, they do. They work through um, love. Your own studio works through love. 
every enterprise in a capitalist economy works through solidarity, love, sympathy, um, what about common greed? courtesy. Greed, self-interest. Greed is part of it. Self-interest is part of it. But my point is that the any economy, socialist or capitalist or however you wish, is a mixture of the virtues of love and hope and faith on the one hand and the virtues, uh, the virtues indeed of prudence, which it is, prudence which by itself is called greed. But when, it, it's, when it's in, in tune with justice and courage and temperance and love, it works pretty well. And so it's, it's not as if there's a greed is good. I don't believe gr greed is good, and I agree that that was the theme of the University of Chicago when I was there uh, a long time ago, I have to say. And then that's a f foolish, and I should say boyish way I was going to say, uh, do you believe now, reflecting on your own life and your own academic intellectual experiences, that that was very much a, a male-driven agenda? Absolutely. It's the, it's the, it's the, it's the soccer playing ice hockey view of the world. We're out there to compete, forgetting that to have a good soccer team or a good uh, ice hockey team, you need immense amounts of cooperation. Any enterprise um, has to have both. And in fact, you can think of, uh, 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 of capitalism, these free markets I admire, somewhat free markets, as enormous amazing systems of cooperation so that everything well, it's interesting in the you say that because cooperation is so often a, a, a word know. used by social democrats or even socialists to to counterpoint the competition word that making, dominates capitalism absolutely and they're making a mistake because you you uh, the the market itself is a way of persuading sweet talk some remote person to supply the material that makes this glass. And it's cooperation. What else would you call it? Well, I'll tell you what, as we finish and reflect both on your ideas and your personal story, do you believe, when you look around uh, economic management and politics in the world today, yeah. that it is still way too male-oriented, that the sorts of approaches to economics you're bringing to the table are still not reflected in policymaking? They aren't. And, and the problem is the economists, the economists and calculators, as it, is, as it was famously said, they say greed is good. They say that all that matters is the bottom line. But in actual functioning, real enterprise, all these virtues have to be in play in order that it doesn't turn into vice. So. I think we need a rethink of market economies. We, we don't want to throw them away. They're a fantastically valuable tool for helping the poor. They're so much larger in effect than any redistribution we can do. Since 1800, incomes per head in places like Britain or the United States have increased by a factor of 20 or 30. That helps poor people a lot more than a 5 or 10 or 15 percent redistribution. It's 2,900 percent as against 15 percent. So your you contention want? is there can be a markets-based, market-driven capitalism with a human face? With a human face. I call it humanomics. I'm going to leave it with that word, humanomics. Deirdre McCluskey, thank you very much. Thank you, For Deirdre. being on Hard Talk. Thank you. I've enjoyed it. Thank you very much.